to have him here at Nagarajas today. So thank you so much for coming. Oh, pleasure, thank you. <laughs> right. That's putting pressure, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks so much. It's my first ever time at Bangalore JS. I'm very really happy to, you know. I thought you're not going to start this way. You need to sing for us. Yeah. <laughs> I, have like, I have like 30 minutes to do something which is, which is bordering technical, like you know, at least scraping the surface to, to kind of stay relevant. So, so thanks so much. So um, big fan of us. <laughs> <laughs> my superheroes are a little different from yours. That picture is actually scaled down to fit the screen. <laughs> a full size picture would actually need a PBR Gold Plus screen. But hey, that's how it is. So, no worry. Just that you know me, for the people who have not met me, my name is Harish. Uh, I take care of front end stuff at this company called Mintra.com, which is trying to make you buy t shirts, shoes, trousers, <laughs> <laughs> more personal things so that I can keep my job. I also moonwalk with a bank called Adam, and I tweet at etc. And most importantly, I'm a very nice guy. So. <laughs> Did you say you moonwalk with Adam? Yeah. Is that a bad thing? Moonlight. <laughs> no, no, I don't moonlight. I moonwalk with it. <laughs> well, this is my this is my talk today. Set of random falling objects. Not really. How how many of us are working with canvas here? Cool. How many of us are wanting to work with canvas? All of us would be wanting to work for things. <laughs> Whether or not we want to work on a different issue, but when you ask the question, everybody wants to do whatever. So, so people working with Canvas, a quick question. Are you working with any frameworks or are you hacking with Canvas all by yourself? Free, native, JavaScript. JavaScript APIs. Just yeah. JavaScript APIs. Yeah. Doing some 3 JS stuff, so that's Three pretty three awesome. 3 JS is pretty cool. Yeah. Anybody doing anything else? Paper JS? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I might talk, I was just trying to pimp <laughs> Easel JS today in this talk. Uh, two reasons. I've been using that ever since it was sort of conceptualized and implemented by Grant Scala. I used to work for Adobe at that point in time. I also had an opportunity to contribute to some part of EasyJS in its early times, uh, which I had to detach off. So, um, so I have I have like 25 minutes with you guys, and here's what I intend to do. So, for people who are already um, you know working with Canvas, I'm just trying to introduce a new framework called EasyJS to you guys, if in case you're not worked with it. For the people who are not working with Canvas, I will actually put a couple of uh, points forward in terms of why this talk is more about Easel JS and less about Canvas in itself, um, and then we'll get started. So, so um, before I started working with HTML5 per se, I came from um, Adobe Flash as a runtime, and I I'm sort of used to working with drawing surfaces, as you understand, like you know, stuff onto which you draw pixels. Uh, but what was interesting to me when I started working with Canvas is that. Uh, one fine day I was thrown with literally what is a canvas. Like you, know, you can only draw pixels into it, and everything subsequent to that that is drawn into it is just dead pixels. So very simple things, what I used to be like, you know, very familiar to is like I have three shapes, and to be able to click each one of them without having to write a lot of code, suddenly became a lot of code. Because a canvas only gets an event at canvas level. Then you actually go and dig what pixel is behind your mouse, and then understand what that is, and so on and so forth. So, uh, for me, who was pampered by having a display object based on time like Flash, I found that counterintuitive. I found it difficult to work with. That's when I started looking at this framework called. Um, so I, I actually started with Paper.js. I don't know if somebody has seen that. It's 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 a nice little compositing based yeah. library which also does a bit of Canvas, bit of SVG, so on and so forth. Uh, then I sort of bumped into um, to Easel.js. It's actually now a collection of frameworks called Create.js. So it has got Easel JS, Preload JS, Sound JS, and uh, uh, one more. So, well, so that's that's the deal. And so today, see, here is what I'm trying to do. So I just cooked up this demo. Like you know, this is something for the folks who came for my JS food talk uh, in in Bangalore. I think I see a bunch of familiar faces. But how many of us were at my talk at JS food last year? You have seen this. So so unfortunately, it's going to be sort of a rerun for you guys. We've already seen this, but for the benefit of uh, the larger audience here. Like I'm going to rerun some of my talk. It's, um, so this demo is about building a funny, functional, sometimes addictive game using Canvas, ground up, right into the device, in the next 20 minutes. Like, you know, I'm not going to run through code, nor am I going to say this is what I did, and so on and so forth. I'm going to type out code right in front of you, and thereby trying to tell you how do we go about writing something like this using Canvas. And the aim is to not 
to teach you canvas programming. Canvas programming is, is a whole lot more than what this trivial demo is about. But I think it should be a good start point for you to start looking at create JS as a library, isn't JS as a library, and, and how do you program with that. And uh, there are, uh, so it's, it's like a bunch of falling faces. And uh, the game is pretty simple, so you can just keep busting them. I am trying to write a Facebook variant of this by replacing those faces with faces of people whom I don't like. <laughs> 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 and, and I think it is going to be pretty addictive. Yeah. I have already identified the people whom I am going to act like. <laughs> and also oh. add some sound and, and assorted effects to it. Uh, but to kind of maintain the political correctness of a user group meeting, I have just changed to faces that sort of look like the people whom I dislike. <laughs> so, so that's the deal. So, um, so, here, so uh, somebody from the audience, this is something which I always ask so for, the, uh, for the fun of it and also to kind of keep time sanity. Somebody from the audience have to keep time for me. And no, you're the organizer. I don't trust you. <laughs> somebody, I don't know. I'm just kidding. Yeah, so um, we should be done with this uh, in 20 minutes, like, you know, building a ground up. Following are the orders of engagement. Like I'm going to code this whole thing up, but I'm not going to code things that don't make any sense. For example, if there is a pre-constructed array of objects, I'm not going to type it out for you guys just to prove that I know how to create an array. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm only going to write sensible code. So if that's too bad, that's too bad. So and secondly, whoever is keeping my time, if I'm scratching my head or if I'm fiddling my laptop or if I'm generally looking, wondering about life, that counts. Time doesn't count. You will count <laughs> only the time that I'm actually writing code over here. Like sometimes the map just decides to crash or the monitor kind of goes off, that doesn't count. So the 20 minutes that I'm kind of trying to promise you guys is the real coding time that I have. Any questions? No questions. <laughs> Fair, awesome. So let's get started. So who is keeping time for me? Bob, are you keeping time for me? Are oh, you keeping time for me? Yeah, a bunch of you can. Right now, we are starting at, what time is it now? 12.03. 12 and what time do you have to finish? 12.23. 12.23? Oh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be rough. But let's do this. <laughs> okay, I practiced this a bunch of times. Okay, so I have a backup which is open on the right hand side of my Sublime Text. If in case I screw up, uh, then I have the the holistic escape route of copy pasting and saying, "Hey, I still wrote it, just that I wrote it a little earlier." So that is my fallback plan. So let's get started. At the back, can you see the screen? You cannot see the screen. I'm gonna pull it up a little, but not a whole lot. Uh, that's good enough at the back? <coughs> All right. Otherwise, you could just move your chairs a little forward or kind of walk forward. Right. OK, so this is my stub. No, I have nothing here. I have just three libraries linked. Preload JS, Easel JS, and Sound JS. I'm not doing any sound today. I have three variables declared. I have a window on load, and I have a canvas. That's all I have. And we're going to build. And uh, we'll assume that I have all the assets that I need for this, like the images and stuff I already have. Right? OK. So. Speaking about um, CreateJS, ESLJS framework, the biggest benefit that it gives is it actually brings you a display object based programming. When you say display object based programming, every entity that you add to the canvas are now event aware. Like, you, know, you can control them as separate entities as opposed to just dead pixels. So if you add an image to the canvas using CreateJS, it typically means that that image can be accessed by an identifier, typically like an ID. But in reality, when you're using straight canvas, you cannot do that. You have to figure out a way to kind of find out what that is. So that is the primary value proposition of having a, a nested display object structure where you can actually have access to the elements that you're adding onto uh, your canvas. So let's get started. So um, something very rudimentary, let's say. I'll type fast. If there are any typographic errors, please point me out so that I can fix them quickly. Then waiting for me to realize it myself. Any questions? No questions. So now here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to do something like this. This line is important. So stage is a class that CreateJS gives you. So what stage does is very simple. You have a canvas. You assign the canvas to the stage. Now that dead pixel surface now becomes programming aware, like it becomes display object aware. So whatever you are now adding onto the stage can be accessed back. Again, reiterating, if you don't do that, you're only accessing pixels. But when you actually do this assignment, you can now get started by doing stuff on the things that you're going to add on it. Right. And 
all of us know how animations or like how canvas works right like you know it works on it has got a frames per second concept and it actually works on like you know how many times do you tick to actually be able to do animations and movements in this so there is a class called ticker and i'm going to just going to set a frames per second to 60 and say sorry What does this do? Basically, this is we are just passing the window object to the ticker, so it understands that how many times the window object is actually giving giving you a frame refresh. So, EaserJS internally implements this add listener and points that back into <coughs> a method called tick, which is already defined over there. So it is at the framework level. So whenever you do that, there is it always redirects back to a method called tick. And when I do a console lo log here, you should be able to see that. This should be okay. Let's just run this. Run this. It is running. What happened? Fair. So now we are ready to get started. So now what do we have to do? So this, this demo, this this game is simple, right? It has got a bunch of faces that appear at random places, and then they start dropping, right? And then there is a step of clicking them and making them drop faster. So to get started, we'll first add those things, right? So if you can see the the tick runs for crazy amounts of times. So it's already at some thousand eight hundred. So you don't want to have thousand eight hundred items on your screen at any point in time, right? You want to control as to how many you want to show. So what I'm doing over here is just programming. So um, something which is not really <coughs> specific to Canvas. I'm not going to explain what I'm doing. If you have a question, you can just ask. So I'm just going to do this. Create a random number and say if r is greater than zero point four. This is a good enough condition to have, right? So that you're actually controlling the number of items that you're going to have on screen. Let's say create a new image. Set image dot src. Fine. I'm just setting the source to that. Now, what we need to do is this image now needs to be added to the the stage. So we create um, see bitmap is a class that EaselJS gives you. So you create an instance of a bitmap and pass the image reference to it, and finally do a. Curious as to how it ran earlier. You have to call a stage dot update inside your tick to be able to kind of update what is being added. So, till here, any questions in terms of what we have done? We just created an image. You need a wrap or virus? Maybe, yes, maybe no. not. <laughs> Anyways, like you know, let us for. Okay, let so us. You're going to be adding a, the same character to the stage every tick. Okay. See, this is. The, I want to keep this less about. Good coding standards and more about how you do with Canvas. There are a bunch, bunch of things that you can do. So don't tell me you didn't put a semicolon or your variable name convention is bad. Accusation taken, but I don't have time for refactoring it right now. Right? Let us just run this and see what's happening. Okay, there is that face of my friend appearing there, but the thing is, it is not interesting yet because it's appearing one on top of the other. Correct. Now there are two things that we need to do. One is to make it kind of scattered over the screen. The second one is to give a perception that they are actually happening in sort of with some sort of a depth perception. Mm -hmm. See, <coughs> this is all silly feelings in a demo. Okay, you don't really need them all to learn this, but I generally want to look like somebody who has attention to detail. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just going to do that. So um, some very trivial math we are going to do, right? So we'll say let the y be always at ten. And let's say, how much do you want this to? I constructed some algorithm here, man, which actually keeps it. Yeah, this is good. Okay, 
my width is 800 pixels so I'm just creating a random position right so I'm just saying math dot random and yeah it's just a random calculation so you know don't fret too much about what this is let's see what this looks like when we run this time check please that's good so it's now appearing in in random positions now the next step that we need to do is that they actually have to appear with some sort of uh, a depth perception and I'm going to cheat that by actually scaling this element so I can just do something like right and say <coughs> so scale X and scale Y are again two very useful properties that CreateJS gives you so you can actually scale an element a bitmap that is added onto your screen so this should start looking a lot nicer now let me a lot better so now this has got issues okay if I keep leaving it like this it's gonna add bottomless number of elements on the screen and very soon any great browser of the world is gonna die so we're gonna we're gonna change that in in some time like at the moment let's just assume that we'll very quickly refresh before we get into that situation now uh, let us let me ask this question very simple um, you know physics math question like when when we say an object moves from one point to the other what is exactly happening it's just a translate right either an X or Y translates and translation has two parameters that drives it one is the position uh, a at t of 1 and the position b at t of n correct and what what the difference between two objects that I'm that translating is a parameter called speed or velocity mm -hmm. so these are things that we need to remember whenever we are moving things right? no whatever is the speed it moves from t of 1 to t of n at, at that speed and the translation happens so so even for falling objects if you actually have same velocity for all of them it will look as if like one frame is entirely moving down like you, know, you actually drew a picture with yeah. All of them are randomly placed and they all move together. That's what the perception you'll get. So to do that, to be able to crack that, we'll assign random, random velocities random. to the individual objects and kind of drop them at those velocities. Fair enough. So let us create a I want it to be always greater than one. And multiply it by a factor. It's just some random calculation should not necessarily bother about this and simply say y this dot well x. You're not translating in the x direction, you're only translating in the y direction. So fine. So now we have assigned a velocity to this. Now what we need to do is we need to make them drop down. For them to drop down, see right now what we're doing is we are just adding each of these vices that we're creating to the stage. And sometimes there are two things that you can do. One is go to the stage itself. It has got a property called children. To find out what you have added, you can iterate through the children of the stage itself to find out what are the references you have. Or sometimes, you know, it is better to persist them yourselves. So I'm a big fan of not, not chugging the display object to find out elements. I, I tend to keep them as references. Now we can argue back and forth on this in terms of what is more valuable in performance and I do not know, I, I tend to think that if you're actually maintaining it differently, you have the extra risk of actually having to maintain your, your display object and your array parity. So, but the benefit is you have like a smaller data structure to work with. The flip side of reading the entire display object tree is that it will have elements that you don't need as well. So you're actually writing additional code to skim out things that you need. So it is a programming choice that individually we make based on what performance we want to achieve. So in this particular case, Considering A, performance is not what I'm trying to drive home. I'm going to uh, you know, keep that separate as uh, an array. And I'm just going to, I think I've declared it already. So I have an array called viruses here. I'll simply do this. I come over here and say, so I have a reference to each virus that I create. It keeps getting pushed onto this uh, array. Now, what is our next step? We need to start dropping them down which is sort of very simple I'll tell you so I'm just going backwards on the array and you'll say virus any questions still here none right 
you just get access to a particular virus and you will say virus dot y plus equal to somebody tell me simple mathematics so they should start dropping the objects now already who thinks it will work I think it will work wow look at that there you go so you already have stuff dropping at different velocities but there is a small screw up here right can you see that small dot it kills the game. I can't hit that. Sometimes it, it would just happen to be the guy whom I hate the most. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I want a certain hit area that I always need. This is just programming sanity, but what the hell. So I'm just going to do here. Not the most intelligent program, but never mind, it just works. <laughs> so that I always have a face to hit. Right? You can anyways generate random numbers between point and point. Right? Ah, that's true. That's true. So in this particular case, considering the fact that I'm going the quick and dirty and want to win in 20 minutes mode, <laughs> this is the best I can do. Yeah. Okay, so maintaining reference to the objects by yourself, uh -huh. uh, there's one specific con with it that I, even, yeah, I face, especially when you're doing animation with thousands of objects, mm -hmm. uh, memory leaks. Like even here, you basically have a leak. Viruses will, even the ones that drop off the thing, the array will. I, no, no, but the, when the viruses drop off, there are two things that I will do. Hopefully oh, in this talk. Okay. One is when the height, when the Y position of a virus crosses 500 pixels, I will knock him off the display object and I'll get the reference and knock him off the array. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah. So, so I, I will have to do that. So, so like I said, you don't have to do that if you don't persist it separately. Mm -hmm. You just have to say if the elements ha y is greater than 500, you'll simply say stage dot remote child that. So, but the only problem here is sometimes the stage might have elements like my score, like you know yeah, you background and things like that. Then my iteration will have to go through unnecessary children of the canvas, which at times can get complicated because it is right now it is like a straightforward hierarchy. There is no right. composites. And if you had more time, you would actually make another hierarchy. In that Correct. So I, I would build composites, right? This whole thing could be a composite. I'm just working within a right, composite. Right. So, so those are the stuff that we have to do. But here at least I will clear it out, at least for the, to start with. And, and the point is very pertinent. If you don't maintain your equality between the array that you're creating as well as the stage that you have, A, you will have memory leaks. B, you are not working with the right objects anymore. Because what you think was the object in the past will never be the object because you have knocked it off the stage anyways. So good points to remember. Well, how, where am I in terms of time? Five minutes. That sucks. Hang on. <laughs> so see, but that five minutes does not count all this yeah. cross conversations that I've been having. So it's not five minutes, right? It's more than that. <laughs> never mind. So I, the next step is to actually click the virus and make it die, right? So. I'm going to code fast now. Just going to call a method called kill virus. Takes an event and say virus is equal to event. You're putting pressure on me, man. <laughs> Very simple, right? I click, I get the event of target, I assign a property. JavaScript is beautiful. You can just randomly assign properties. Like not generic <coughs> objects. So I just add the property called is killed. Now all I need to do is come here in this for loop and say if virus dot is is killed. What should I do? That's it. I just increase the velocity of that so that every increment it actually goes faster, which gives you the illusion of this thing falling down. Somebody give me the sound effect, man. I didn't get that. <laughs> I got more or less where I wanted to. How now I'm on the stretch time, how much more time do I have? I can take my own time. <laughs> you know I'm in business, right? I, mean, I, I got something working. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, the click is like pixel perfect. The click is pixel perfect primarily because what EaselJS does is whenever you create a bitmap instance, it actually creates what is called a bounding box based on the number of pixels you are drawing into that particular area. So when you're creating a bitmap, so it actually has this imaginary bounding box which it believes is the space between the the, the colored pixels and the clear pixels. So if you are clicking within the bounding box, you will get pixel perfect, perfect click. Now there's a catch over here. If you're using transparent PNGs, which does not have, yeah. uh, you know, which, which has got clear pixels, those clicks will not dispatch oh, because clear pixels travel through to the canvas. Oh, so you'd use that, for example, to have custom hit areas and stuff. Yeah. Like that. 
So basically, if you want to do collision detection, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, for this thing, you should probably depend upon the volume boxes. So, but typically, what happens is it actually flattens it out to a bitmap. So, majority of times, what you actually get is all colored pixels. You don't necessarily have situations where you have, like you know, pass through pixels and create. By default, when you're working, unless you're using your own met methodology to actually kind of create those elements, which has got clear pixels in them, CreateJS typically creates painted pixels. So, you typically would get all wet pixels within a bounding box area. So, your clicks should more or less be. I think we can add an email listener which will you know, uh, use the get uh, image data API and uh, check for the Yeah, so the only, prob the only problem here is get image data would actually mean you're actually going and digging into the bitmap object and finding out yes. what Unicode is. You might not want to do that in, in reality. And, and yeah, so the, the, the hit area is generally uh, so pretty low. So if one object is overlapping on the other, only the top object gets a click at the moment. Okay. Because you're, the way you're, how are you registering it? You're registering it per instance. Mm -hmm. So if, if the depth of that instance is on top, it is not going to pass through. Okay. Is there a way to like make it like? So that is uh, not something which I've tried. So it is basically bubbling. If you're actually saying this thing actually bubbles all the way up, and kind of you have to figure out who's behind it and track it as well. The framework in itself does not tell you what is behind. So when you see him in my code, I have no uh, no logic which tells who is behind who and how many of them are on stage. So it is a pretty dumb piece of code that I've written. But in reality, if you're trying to do stuff like what you're mentioning, like you know collision detection, hit testing, like you know uh, multiple event pass throughs, we'll have to code up for them. So uh, just taking a step back, create ESLGS is a lot about abstracting out what used to be code pixels into a more display object, what we used to call as a movie clip based programming model. Like it is it is like you know you have specific identifiable instances of shapes that you're adding to the canvas and be able to act on them. See and that is that is one of the primary uh, you know uh, plus points I saw when I got started to it. But ESLJS itself is a monster. It does like really crazy things. It can do transforms, it can do like you know pixel blurs, it can do kind of pixel modifications, you know, hue saturation controls. It can literally do like you know pixel level mathematics to do crazy stuff. I will probably take like a two minutes extra to kind of show you a couple of demos that he has put up on the, you know, the ESLJS page itself, which kind of tells you what more you can do with it. And this is probably the real lowest common denominator of what you can do with, with ESLJS. So it sort of begins here. And uh, the, the other extreme of what you can do with it is actually pretty crazy. I mean, we can, we can really do uh, mad stuff. So with the liberty of another three or four minutes, can I just, uh, you know, I'll so let me let me ask you this question. If all of us are kind of familiar with it, I will not quote it up. I'll just show it. How many of us are working with CSS sprites? Okay. How many of us know what it is? All of us do. CSS sprites, sprite sheets. Well, okay. So, so one one feature which I which, which I really like about ESLJS is that it actually allows you to use sprite sheets to actually do animations within the context of canvas. I think it's pretty cool. It's, so what you can typically do is you have like a sprite sheet, you can animate that within the context of this. So for the people who do not know a sprite sheet, you go to like, let's say uh, yahoo.com and right click on an image and say show image. It'll Instead of showing a single image, it'll actually show up a big image with images placed one on side of the other. So that is, in real layman, dumb, stupid terms, that's what a sprite sheet is. Okay. Its utility is not about animations. Its utility is that kind of allows you to batch images into one and kind of ship them only once when you're hitting the server so that you don't have iterative server calls to bring your images, which enhances the performance of your page. But then when CSS3 came through, and, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I, I, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so that's, so I mean, it's, 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 it's a fairly known concept, so I'm not going to can tell you what that is. So one good thing that Grant has done in ESLJ is, is that he has kind of figured out a way to incorporate sprite sheets to animate stuff within the run. So if you see my the demo that I already cooked up, you can see that those respective objects animate. Do you see that? And those are sprite So those are done using a, a, a sprite sheet implementation. For purely for want of time, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna code that up. You should probably trust me that I know how to do it. <laughs> are they just by the No, they're not. So so GIFs are about multiple frames at authoring time. So basically, they have frame information when you actually create them. But Canvas is a bitmap drawing surface. So what you draw into Canvas is pixels. So what happens is when you draw a GIF into a Canvas, the, the, the every second unto n frames get muted. Only the first frame gets drawn. So that is why you cannot. And 
we are all in an unfashionable world if we actually say gifs. This room is actually pretty kind. Wait, so you should certain other nefarious quarters will get bored. If you had to do that, then you would have to take a GIF, write your own logic to extract the frames, and then okay. and then, then stick it together. Like because yeah, because right. for pixel drawing surfaces, the uh, only the first frame is drawn, the main is muted. And somebody in Brigade Road told me GIFs are old school, and <laughs> and you look very unfashionable when you say GIFs. <laughs> so that's the reason. I I generally try to I generally try to give the impression that I'm always on the top end. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? <laughs> no, if GIFs are awesome, they are awesome. I mean, I am not taking sides. I, I just, I just said what I heard. I think we are mixing uh, web development with application development. Generally, we are using uh, web building websites and application wherein more of the GIFs are there. But for such an application, which is so much uh, totally canvas oriented. Uh, That's true, man. But I somehow still get worried with all those jumping monkeys, <laughs> which are almost always GIFs. Today, sound very opinionated. This is my slide sheet. More or less a flicker effect, right? Flickerbook. Which one? Flickerbook. Flipbook. Flipbook. Yeah. Flipbook. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Yeah, that's how sprites work. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly how sprites work. So I'm not, I'm not that good at creating these things, but mm -hmm. luckily for me, I still own a copy of Flash Pro. <laughs> Despite <laughs> having left the job from Adobe, I still have a copy of Flash Pro. So I just. <laughs> So you I have a script that generates this. Isn't no, no, Flash Pro. Gen you can actually create a twinned animation using Flash Pro and say it's for us. Yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah, I got pampered with certain stuff that Adobe puts forward, and this is one of them. So yeah. And there are multiple spriting tools available. Right? You don't necessarily have to. As a developer, which is the easier approach? Because when I saw the demo first, I assumed that there were three or four moving parts that you have code for each one. But you're saying that it's a spread. Which one was easier for you? Since you have flash experience, I'm guessing making something and just making generating a sprite is faster. Generating a sprite with the right kind of tool, like for example, you're using Flash Pro, mm -hmm. generating a sprite is super easy because it's like one click. Like you actually see, I, I'm sometimes hoping that you no, know, I might never be able to draw the shape. The, this particular one, I got my uh, friend to draw it for me. This, mm -hmm. this whole wire shape, and uh, she just did a tween animation, like a nice classic tween, which is like. This thing just rotates, yeah, exactly. and uh, I go to the library panel of Flash Pro and say export into Sprite Sheet. <laughs> it just gave me that. So I think it is. I think it's super awesome. But if you want more complex things, I think graphic de graphic designers have their way out in in solving this. Other than that, I could have just see the other approach for doing this would have been if it's just a spin. And for the ones which are spinning, yeah. it's probably easy to do. Just add the symbol and kind of. Uh, increment the rotation property yeah, right. in a rotate. But it does more than that, right? If you see, this fellow does not rotate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He it's actually nice does something nice. else. So when you have more detailing, sometimes you might have to work with, um, with sprite sheets. And I found, I'll just show you the code. Working with sprites is so easy in, in, in CreateJS. So you just have to, see, I just cooked up this array, if you see there. There's an array called sheets. I have multiple properties. I have an image reference. I have the width and height registration acquisition by a number of frames. So I just have to create a sprite sheet object, which is again something that CreateJS provides. So you can just look at the function, the, the load sprite sheets. I can just walk you through them. It's, it's nothing. So you just create uh, an image and pass a reference to, the f to a random image, and then create a sprite sheet params property, which has got an image, the frames that you need to run with, and an animation that you need to do. So the animation here is, I'm calling it spin, but it is an animation that runs from frame 0 to the number of frames. Mm -hmm. So let's say the first image has 73 frames, it's going to run from 0 to 73. If the other one had 86, it's going to run from 0 to 86. And you can, and um, CreateJS abstracts out a method called go to and play. For anybody who came from the Flash world would remember that syntax. Go to and play is to kind of go to a particular frame and play from there. So if you say go to and play spin, it's going to play from the 0th frame to 76th frame, and then kind of keep looping. So that is what. That is what has been done uh, in this example. So if you see here, the code, everything that we wrote still remains the same excepting here, see? Instead of saying why is it a new bitmap, you'll say new bitmap animation and pass a sprite sheet to it. And the remaining of your code sort of remains just as is. So that, that's pretty simple. And there are a couple of things that we need to see over here. See, one is what uh, Sunil mentioned. Like you know, right now it is adding stuff and they're not getting cleared off, the, off your memory. So I'm not going to write that now, but always remember that if you're adding objects dynamically, you always want to clear them based on certain exit criteria. In the, this particular case, the exit is at crossing the 
the the y boundary. In certain other cases, the exit could also be, and not just that. The exit could also be like a click. If instead of moving them down, you're actually popping it away. Or so whatever it is, you need to know what your exit condition is and always clear out your your display object area. If you are actually bombarding with a lot of content, then you're actually going to run There's another concept that you want to apply in Canvas. Everybody, how many of us know what is bitmap caching? How many of us know what caching is? <laughs> Sometimes life is like that. Like, you know, you what, know what caching is, sometimes you just have to extrapolate. <laughs> <laughs> for dumbness sake. It's not everything, but it is something. You know, bitmap caching, for instance, what CreateJS does is, if you have the same sprite or same sort of bitmap that is getting added multiple times into your canvas, CreateJS has a way to actually cache those number of pixels and repurpose them. Instead of actually having to draw them again and again. So what happens is when you actually cache them, it actually gets put to the GPU and kind of runs on GPU, which gives you really fast performance. He has a very, very nice demo on the CreateJS side. I'll just quickly show you that. So, so this is the site. You guys can kind of go take a look at the CreateJS. So if you look at this, can you see this like, this is crazy, right? It's like, this is pretty similar to what I'm trying to do. There's like a random elements being added. And you can see it's running at 26 frames per second. So there's a small little checkbox that is put on top, right? Enable caching. So it runs at 47 frames. So it's like, it's pretty cool. The only caveat, as he calls out, is Safari 6, which apparently has a different way of treating this. But pretty much across everything, IE, Firefox, uh, all of them kind of do 47 or more. I have, in certain, in certain cases, seen IE do a lot more than, the, the more newer versions of IE is doing a lot more than uh, Chrome or Firefox in, in certain scenarios. Actually, but IE is Internet Explorer? <laughs> 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 See, dude, you want to do what you got to do. That, the MS Evangelist in the back. Kick me out of this room. MS Evangelist will not kick me out of this room. You should be happy that I'm saying this. No, 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 exactly. You're like, yeah, we're like, Raj, you can buy me a beer later. <laughs> right, so um, yeah, it's and finally the the most amazing things that most of us developers like and our companies don't is that this is free open source available to use whatever way you like. <laughs> See, most of us want to work for companies that pay you pretty high, but we ourselves don't want to buy anything. That's the software engineer. Yeah, which is which is the way I am also. I mean, I have had this dual life of wanting to work for a company which you really want to sell tools and make money to a company which is making you buy t-shirts. So there's there's <laughs> commercials at some point in time. So never mind, but this does not come with a commercial standpoint. It's free open source, pretty well supported, and it is pretty uh, in active development, and there are a lot of high-end sponsors there. It is in the silhouette. I don't want to pimp those companies, so make what you know of those logos on top. User general knowledge. Those are logos that you know. One is Raj's company. <laughs> One is my ex company. <laughs> right, so there are quite a few good sponsors for this project. So he is, uh, Grant is going to keep building good stuff on this library and you'll, you'll have fair reliability. And uh, along with ESLJS, this is another library. Somebody mentioned uh, D3. D3 is a pretty cool uh, library as well. It does a lot of SVG stuff in addition to Canvas. The other one that I sort of like. D3 is not for animation. D3 is not necessarily for animation. D3 is more with respect to do data visualization yeah. and kind for of. For complete yeah. application, people generally use a combination of three and D3. So yeah. three, three, gives three is more for three is more for your three D stuff, right? I'm like that Mr. Doops thing, right? Like yeah, yeah. Mr. Doops thing. Yeah. So this is paper. It does little more mental things than than where it actually does path morphing and so on. So there's like some really cool demos over here. Like I'm just throwing this out for you guys. This is pretty cool. I really like the way it works on the browsers. It's, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. How is the performance of SVG and Canvas? Usually SVG performs poorly compared to Canvas. Right? It's, it's subjective, right? You know, where are you running the SVG on you has a lot of like variance. Like you wanted to uh, track, like, this object got clicked, I wanted a uh, user spoiled by flash. So SVG, in SVG, track and click, so on each object is very really easy. Correct. So, so when I look at this, I've done a bunch of uh, stuff on SVG as well. So I did a project to compare between SVG and Canvas. I'll just quickly show you that. Both had its own caveats. So SVG, I used a framework called Rafael.js. So um, uh, it sort of obfuscated a lot of things that I did not want to know about working with, Can with, with SVG in itself. Uh, the only thing that I predominantly found a challenge in SVG is uh, actually working with complex paths and kind of animating paths and things like that, which is kind of a little easier to do 
uh, in a more display object based model. But in terms of click through and performance and so on and so forth, I sort of found both. And I'll, I'll just try to, I'll let you make the judgment yourself. So I'll just uh, uh, throw open my. So this was last last year. Google put out their Zeitgeist uh, charts. I don't know if you remember. Last year they did a really good job of putting out like a map based thingy, like a 3D map. But the year before that had had some really unreasonable um, uh, visualizations. So let me just try and see. This is the last thing that I'll run. So I did. I, d I tried to recreate that to try and understand what it means to sort of. So this is this is SVG. So this is done entirely using um, RefelJS and SVG, and uh, it works for me with fair amount of reliability. So here, so all those objects that you see, you know, those those isometric projections and st so on and so forth. It's all this is all done using RefelJS and SVG. So it sort of worked really well. At the same time, I. Um, I This is all canvas. This had got see this I did in canvas primarily because this extrapolation was really this interpolation was hard to do in 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 Rafael at that moment. I didn't know enough Rafael to to pull that off. So this was easy to do in canvas. You can see those this line chart sort of animates along with the movement. So and your background animates. There's a bunch of things that is running one on top of the other and it works pretty smoothly. So this was the other thing. So I mean I don't think the performance battle is a, is a, is an incorrectly pitched one. It's largely about which runtime are you working on? See, if you are saying like an older Android browser where there's patchy SVG support, and if you're actually choosing SVG, you're probably oh, in the wrong direction. So, can you say that again, please? I built images. Oh, really? Oh, that's simple. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I found Canvas hard to use for building images. Actually, Canvas hard to uh, do for? Canvas hard to use for building an image. Like probably, yeah. So, so yeah. So that's that's a, that's a, that's a good standpoint, right? So he has a use case where. He genuinely found SVG to be the better option to go. So I would, I would not take sides. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there are things that you can do with SVG really well. And I, I, I got an opportunity to work on a lot of SVG uh, plus plus features when I was in Ruby. I think it's pretty cool, uh, but it's largely depending upon your own use case and your own requirement, and your own interest in terms of how you want to program with SVG. So, uh, one, one obvious thing that I, I really like about SVG uh, is the fact that. Of course, the vector aspect is one. See, I, 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 the one thing which I really miss in CSS animations at the moment, unless somebody else has polyfilled it or something, see, I don't necessarily have the ability to do sequential eventing. See, I don't know how when the first animation finished, and I want to trigger second, and I want to trigger third, and I want to trigger fourth. This is something which I find really hard if I'm actually doing direct CSS animations, unless I'm putting a JavaScript shim on top and kind of figuring it out. But but SVG actually allows you to do se sequential and parallel animations right on top. The support is still iffy, but if it really comes through, then that solves a lot of problems because it's inherently a vector, right? Now you can actually do scaling, morphing, and whatnot, but you can actually do path morphing very easily. You have like a tick morphing into a cross. It's like super duper simple to do if you're actually working with SVG. So typically stuff like morphing and all. So SVG definitely has its charm and value. Uh, is it universally applicable? Is every problem that Canvas can solve solve with SVG? At this moment, I don't want to comment. I mean, I, and, and that definitely gets into a space where we are taking sides and we are actually. Well, the moment you get into particle system. systems or anywhere which is not a vector specific thing, right. it's not a problem. Yeah, and one thing which I, which again I, I like about Canvas is its ability to actually crunch pixels. Like, you know, if I'm actually doing, so I don't know if I'm actually building. Uh, I mean, I, I am interested to see. How SVG solved your hue saturation problems? How it allowed you to do this blurs, and how it allowed you to do, uh, you know, HSP corrections, HSL. I don't know how you managed to do them. I find them very easy to do with Canvas. So I'm I'm unsure as to how SVG uh, would help you do some of that. I have gaps in understanding. I'm not saying SVG can't do it. I'm probably not very sure. SVG has filters, uh -huh. and then there's the Adobe yeah. filter spec also for CSS, yeah. which should work so on that. Which is correct. SVG which is correct. So, but what happens is the Adobe's uh, the, the CSS filters that you're talking about. CSS filter. The CSS, the CSS filter lab. Uh, so that is the other one, right? So I mean, one of the other experiments I did. So talking about that, not necessarily trying to pimp my own work, but this is interesting. If you guys are interested to take this and kind of contribute to this, I'll be very happy that if somebody can. So it is. It is on my GitHub. This is a plugin that I am building for uh, folks who are working with JavaScript and who don't necessarily care about CSS. So this is all CSS filters, and you can actually work them through jQuery. So you can actually say stuff like hue rotate this. 
Yeah, so it is just jQuery. It's like a very thin library. It's about 4KB library that is there. It's it's just pretty rudimentary right now, but if anybody's interested in kind of taking this forward, I have stopped building this. I don't have time to uh, spend on this one. You can even do like you know, stacked effects, which is really hard to otherwise cook up using CSS. So you have hue rotate plus CPR. You can change stuff like this, and, and you can even do... So this is one... This, you, can, you can do stuff like this. You, know, you can do a hue rotate animation. It rotates it and fires a complete. You can do stuff like this, and you can even do stacked. So you can do a CPR plus blur. And it actually follows the jQuery's syntax itself. It's calling direct jQuery dot animator. It's actually an excellent top of that. So basically, you can do stuff like this. But CSS filters in itself is very, very specky at the moment. You know, there are stuff that you can do. There are stuff that you can do. So basically, the question is about just blurs and you know CPRs and grayscales and all that. Point taken. But how are you going to do stuff like this? I still don't know. So I mean, this is. It has got that whole. HDR-ish thing that's happening. It actually is using a custom CSS filter which is separate on top of a DAV and then there's an alpha transpose put on top and things like that. So I don't know. That's what I said. So I don't know. Probably you can crack this. But in Canvas, I already know how I'm doing this. So if with SVG, I do not know how I'm doing this. So that's the reason why I said probably it's, it's, it's interesting to ponder. But, and, and I think that is the point. So probably, you know, maybe we'll be happy to hear you out in terms of how you went about that so that you can get a benefit from that. And have you already spoken about that here? Have you already spoken about your uh, your work here? Might be interesting to see. I I significantly overshot, so I just want to stop here. I mean, I I will be happy to take questions offline. I don't want to hijack the, the remaining proceedings. I'm right here, so uh, finally speak to me. And uh, thank you so much. And that's me, Harish Ramakrishnan. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, so we're going to take a quick five minute break in case you have to go to the bathroom and then we'll carry on with the second round of uh, flash talks. Thank you guys. No, 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 it can take a I thought if there's time, just a little bit. If you have a speaker, then yeah. Not the next time I'll have something to do. Yeah, I'll do it. Go.